I start my podcast with claps. And I shall we do a little kind of cross rhythm? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's do let's do uh, crossed and triple uh, triole. Let's do two two with three. Who's doing two, three? I'm doing three. Okay. Okay. What next? Okay. You wanna do now five over my two? Five over your two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you record all this? Oh, you are recording! Oh my goodness! Uh, but I'm here. We'll keep yeah, this up. Uh... Yeah, yeah, it'll stay. See, this is how I like to manage my podcast. I like to start without you noticing that I. Ah, uh, very clever, very, very, clever. very, very clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, as uh, as you guys noticed, those of, of you who are watching, this time it's in English. Yeah, it is in English. Bushraturk, ahlo sahla fiki bil halqa khamstash. من البودكاست uh, it's been a year in the making uh, almost i would say and uh, i have the pleasure to to interview you today since you happen to be to be in paris so uh, thank you for accepting the invitation thanks for having me so uh, just so people know bushra is a lebanese english composer and she speaks arabic But uh, you prefer not to express yourself in Arabic. Could you maybe tell the viewers about that? I express myself better in the when I express love in Arabic. But intellectually, I think because I was born and raised in London, I can. I think I can express my best. Uh, Why love? Better. Like love is yeah, is, is a hard thing to talk about, no? If I say I love you, it means much less than an apabik. Why? Why do you reckon? It's it comes from a deeper place in my body, mm. and I don't recognize the I love you as much as the Arabic. Because I guess it's because it's my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. Arabic was my first language, but I guess having a British education did take it over somehow, unfortunately. <laughs> and <laughs> you know this is a curious topic see since us Lebanese uh, happen to be bi and trilingual in some instances quadrilingual it is it is remarkable to notice that we express ourselves differently regarding certain topics we use different languages when we curse sometimes also we choose not to curse in Arabic but rather curse in French not really but in English more so because we feel it attenuates the gravity of the of the curse word mm. uh, I don't know we use substitution mm. and uh, do you think like you have this kind of uh, conflict with your two natal uh, or native languages with uh, expressing matters of uh, the intellect as you say always um... It's very frustrating f for me, I guess, generally to, I mean, sometimes I break into song if I want to express something, you yeah. know, that's another kind of language, isn't it? Please uh, disagree. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I have a feeling you're about to like, but, but no. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> La, no, it, there are, uh, I, you know, I feel like I want to go into Arabic right now sometimes. We, we might. We might. Okay, let's We do might that. surprise you. I, I don't know. Um, there, uh, yeah, it's an amazing. I, I, I call it a gift. I mean, when you're when you're when you're raised in multilingual environments, obviously your brain is functioning differently to mm. monolingual environments, and then it means you have the capacity to learn other languages much more easily. And I feel like. Uh, it's it's worked to my advantage learning German and learning learning Dutch now mm -hmm. as well. Really? Okay. <laughs> Don't tell anybody except everyone will find out on your YouTube podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah, you just said it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's uh, no, it's a gift. I think it's a gift that you know 
being Lebanese or um, unfortunately, you know, uh, colonized lands, you you will you will have people who end up speaking a lot of different languages in one sentence, right? Mm. And that that's interestingly that kind of infiltrates into my musical phrasing sometimes. Yeah, it would it would be worth it to clarify again that you are a musician, you're a composer, and you're. I believe the first composer on uh, the series and I'm excited uh, for it to be you and we're gonna uh, talk about what you do but rather maybe talk now about why you're here what what brings you what brings you to Paris because if it weren't for you coming to Paris I don't think we would have been able to to do this properly Oh I'm here because I have the Paris premiere of an orchestral work of mine called Mosaic and uh, it's being uh, performed by Orchestre Padelou and conducted by Kanako Abe who also conducted my opera Woman at Point Zero and this is the CD Yes and uh, it's a CD mainly dedicated to women composers and women conductors mm. And today, then, they've decided to program it, you know, the live version of Mosaic. And uh, can you give, like, the audiences a, how do you say, an encapsulation of your, of your parkour, or musical parkour? I will do my best to summarize yes. all these years. <laughs> okay, so I was brought up. Uh, the very, I guess, cultured family who very much appreciated bringing music into the home. Mm -hmm. um, I did listen to a lot of, uh, I guess, Lebanese singers and Egyptian singers, but also Mozart and etc. Uh, so I guess different genres um, of music. But I guess the real opportunities came when you're offered music for free at school, which is no longer the case now, unfortunately. What, that what, what is that? Well. It, well, young primary school children are offered free lessons. Ah, okay. And it's no longer the case? Not so much. Okay. It's much less the case, unfortunately. We are not living in a time that music is a, a necessity. They're finding it to be a luxury, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so, I, I was... Um, I think I was introduced to the violin, which kind of came a second nature, but I didn't like the whole position of it. Mm. So it's tedious. Uh, somehow. <laughs> 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 and uh, then, I guess I was maybe six or seven years old, I was uh, someone, you know, they asked us, who wants to learn the cello? And I, without thinking about it, I put my hand up. So it was a kind of impulse, mm. yes. And I... I, you know, I studied the cello and I also studied the piano privately and I was begging for it all the time. I just wanted to learn. I was hungry. I was hungry really? for Really? You were one of those kids? Okay. I was one of those kids. Yeah. I, was like, I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when I, when I hear that from my own students now, when they say, I need more, I need more, I need more music. And I'm like, I understand you. I feel your pain. <laughs> 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 so, um, uh, then I, uh, yeah, I guess I had, there was a lot of fun in music classes. It's always around laughter. Cello teachers were very funny. And it was still in <laughs> primary school? Or? It was still in primary school. Okay. And then when I was 10 years old, I auditioned uh, to go to the Center for Young Musicians, which mm -hmm. is the Saturday music school. And I did that for eight years. Or Until college, what? Until college. And if we fast forward to college, uh, and this might be the first time I asked this, to a composer since you are the the first composer on the series is that when you were 18 17 18 they're yeah. about and were to embark on choosing what you want to do for a living because you know there's a choice you have to make uh, did you embark immediately on a composition specialty or did you go to Gildorf straight away or what did you do I'll tell you how it started because okay. I mean, I was since kind Lebanese of, parents and all, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I all parents maybe. Maybe, maybe they always question your choices yeah. <laughs> in every aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you see, I was 
not always practicing my instruments. I was improvising around Beethoven or jazzifying it, and mm. I was kind of in that meant that mindset, not doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. And I was kind of writing myself. I was kind of influenced by. I was watching the musicals from the 50s, the American musicals. I was mm. very inspired because it was they were really centered around the composer and the the lyricist writing and working on a musical like the making yeah. of the making of, and. Uh, it it didn't come until I was 17 years old. It was the second day of the millennium, mm -hmm. second of January, and it was such a bright sunny day. And this blackbird was tweeting or twittering this rhythm nonstop. It went on a loop, and I was like, oh, I have to write this down. I have to write this down. And I felt like an orchestral piece just poured out of me. And I was explaining to my mom, I couldn't really explain it. It's like, how do you express this mm -hmm. epiphany you have, this kind of this creative need. surge? Yeah. And uh, how happy you are, like, what language do you express that in, right? I didn't, you know, even my emotional vocabulary mm -hmm. in Arabic is, okay, I can express love, but I don't have a massive emotional vocabulary. Um, I... Uh, I, th I felt that kind of dictated my life. I don't know. I was trying not to choose it because I knew it was going to be a hard path. Yeah. Uh, also. But you've managed quite well since. Possibly, but it's hard work. I, you know, you work really hard to. It didn't. Nothing came. You know. Of course, you. Uh, uh, when you're starting out, you have to always try to. You're working hard to prove yourself. Yeah. And, uh, but because yeah, you do a lot of it and. The environment helps. London has, is a great place to be culturally rich. Uh, even even college was free at the time. That is no longer free. I would don't know if I would have chosen the path. But for inner, for citizens, that for is. For citizens, yeah. yes. Yeah. And yes, no, exactly. It's for citizens. And then it was right after high school that you went to to music straight away. Yeah. yeah, I was trying to do French and maybe international relations, but I had nothing to support it <laughs> in my application. It's like I had so much more orchestral playing experience and everything yeah. to support music. I thought, you know what, I'll just do that. And and since then, and since then, you haven't looked back, or have you? We always look back somehow. Um, See, because people don't really understand. Maybe, but maybe they do. It's just we we like to think that they don't. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is that when you when we embark on on this career choice, let's call it a career, but it's not really a career. I don't think in our minds, maybe it's a way of life. Huh? It's a way of life. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, like the the act of f having a surge of need to write and then writing it and then expecting money after it <laughs> <laughs> is yeah. a way of life. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's a. Uh, like it gets too dark sometimes in some places where you go like, why the f, f did I choose to do this? Can I go back? <laughs> but if I go back, what will they think of me? And do you do you ever have this thought of letting other people down by maybe not doing your music? So would it ever cross your mind to not be a composer anymore? Um, I, it, it's hard to say because that's, in some way that's all I know, but my interests are sp spanning a little bit more widely in terms of the art forms or uh, looking into possible uh, transdisciplinary things mm -hmm. or, um, it's, uh, interesting having the music in yeah. the background now. See, I'm going to get a little bit dumber as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe hopefully there's are just the loud bits. Uh, <laughs> good luck to you, Nadine. Right? No, no, don't that worry. Out. <laughs> the mics, the microphones are powerful. I must give that to the uh, Sub Zero company. But uh, you were saying, go ahead. Um. So, yeah, I guess, um, I, I, I mean, I feel like I just want to learn everything about everything. 
See, th also, this is something to re remark about a, yeah. a composer. You, do you believe that a composer should be polyvalent in, in their interests? It definitely informs it, if that's the aim. Um, it definitely informs your music, it informs your outlook, it informs, uh, you know, to have this kind of openness and to look at the subject from many different angles, different uh, expertise or different disciplines. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting for me. Um, but how does it influence the music? See, because we were discussing this pre podcast and we were discussing the idea of advocacy or even before jumping into that just the idea of trying to incorporate worldly phenomena or yeah let's let's call it that into music be it by entitling pieces by certain I don't know, quotes or you know, calling a piece the Empire State Building or like 9-11 or something. Uh, or feminism or feminicide or... Uh, or be it by the language itself. Do you believe that worldly events impact the music that you make? And how? Mm. Um... In many ways, it does, but I don't want to be too obvious about it mm -hmm. somehow. I want to mention the things that are not always mentioned, the things that are marginalized, the issues, the peoples, the things that need to be voiced. Because, I mean, ultimately, that's what, uh, what uh, gives me the impulse mm. to create music these days. And that's the whole idea of giving voice. Mm. Um, and I have, what goes into my music has a very strong conceptual basis. Mm -hmm. And that really helps inform the structure. It, it helps inform how I uh, look at the contour of my melodic line or how I harmonize something. Or if I'm, I sometimes borrow material or use old archival recordings and somehow reimagine them or um, fragmentize and then refragmentize and uh, you know there's a lot of there's so many uh, processes involved in that sense um, taken from the issues that are important to me um, that either from today or from the past perhaps because history does repeat mm. itself unfortunately. unfortunately it does and um could you unpack this yeah for for the listener who might not be familiar with what we call the composition process or whatever we want to call it uh, and it is that idea of transforming and it's like a it's a very curious thing to analyze like transforming worldly event into like contours in music into structure into elements uh, how do you go about that or because you know there, there's the other the, there's the other side of the same faction of people who advocate who only do it post-production mm. you know uh, who write music and then label it as advocacy for anything because mm. it maybe sells more and it's like a good marketing strategy yeah. but we musicians tend to be purists in a sense composers maybe more so than than others we like like this uh, pure element of doing things that are essential so yeah what do you what do you have to say about that and like to simplify it to the uh, listener um I know I can speak from my own yes. personal process. I my music is lost without a strong concept. Mm. So, um, I mean, you could think 
in the purely abstract forms, this is what you want to do, this is what you want to achieve, and this is the outcome, and then find an, a name for it. But practically... Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Practically, sometimes festivals ask you for titles and concepts before you've even written any dots on the page. Okay. Um, so that's the practical sense. Um, but, and then sometimes, I mean, the concept doesn't come until much later. And I think it's a valid process to uh, respect, I suppose. Mm. As not everyone thinks conceptually sometimes they just want to go call it the string quartet number one. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, then you're going on with the canons of those who have called it string quartet mm -hmm. number one, and you know what the music's going to sound like. Mm -hmm. It might be pro, like post Mozartian, you know. <laughs> or, sure, but you know Feldman used to yeah, name true. his pieces piece, you know, or like trio. Or untitled. Or untitled, yeah. <laughs> like painting. Which is a title. <laughs> See, that's... I thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good for you. <laughs> quite Kudos to, to it's you. It's quite hard to accept an untitled piece. I mean, an untitled piece is, if its name un I told, is, if its name is untitled, then it is titled, isn't it? Therefore, yes. Therefore it is. Yeah. Yeah. See, I believe... I might be on the opposite front, like of those people, like you were describing as you know people name their pieces string quartet. I I had a phase where I felt that, yeah, like a, a piece of music shouldn't have any title. It's just what it is. Uh, I'm not there anymore, but I do advocate for a more intramusical kind of uh, intramusical process. You say that your music cannot be understood or might be misunderstood without a, a concept. So by that, do you mean uh, that you introduce the listeners to the concept prior to listening? Or is it, well, it wasn't that that you were looking to, to talk about. Um. Well, it was mainly to inform my own process of composition, but in terms of the audiences, mm -hmm. it's for new music, it, it is quite important to give them a flavor mm -hmm. of what you are going through, you know, what your aims are in writing the piece. It connects them more to it because mm -hmm. not everyone is familiar with contemporary music. Today. Because it's all, I mean, you're talking about uh, Western audiences as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a slight shift. I mean, of, of course. Slight is gentle. It is gentle, but I'm British, so there's always a... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not, I mean, it is, there's a seismic shift. <laughs> <laughs> cataclysmic. No, it's cataclysmic talk, yeah. isn't it? Um, that, I mean, I mean, the age of audiences for contemporary music is getting younger somehow, but it's also depending how it's being programmed and mm -hmm. how it's yeah. approached. So there, it's, something's becoming cool about it, but it's all in the how it's presented. How? Tell us more. This is a secret. Is it? I mean, I don't know if it's at all existent in 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 French, you know, programming. Uh, is well, it? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess British and the how are they going Belgians about it? Belgians and the 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 Dutch are kind of thinking. Well, how are they going about it? Um, I. I, th I mean, it's um, it's not all down to marketing. I think it's down to just the way they present things, and they mm. sometimes they uh, have a very strong conceptual basis. Not like, oh, let's bring in this new composer amongst Bartok and Beethoven, and we might get mm. some audiences. So there's an excuse for it. Yeah, that's what, how they usually do it. No. Yeah, that's how they usually do it. Um, 
but I, I don't know, I find like I've been in the most conservative settings and they've, I feel like there is this hunger. Mm. We've, spoke, we've spoken about different kinds of hunger before in this mm. podcast. But I feel like they, they need something fresh. It's like, I'm done with this Schubert. I keep hearing it in this gil gold gilded cage of this concert hall. And I, I would love to hear that. I mean, you know, but it's, I don't know if it's because I spoke about it bef before my piece or if I, I would have alienated them if I didn't speak about it. Do you it. often speak before your pieces? If I'm invited to, yes. Sometimes uh, concerts don't have program notes. Mm. Do you feel that they're dark. useful at all, program notes? For the afterthought. For the afterthought, when you bring it back home with yeah, you. Yeah, if you care enough, they're yeah. like, oh, I wanted to see, oh, yeah, that was oh, really yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see what she means by that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, yeah, there's nothing quite like, I mean, to have a living composer right in front of you talking about, you know. That you mentioned now, uh, writing. Mm. This is a good segue into the topic that I was eager to discuss with you, which is maybe the encapsulation. I like this word, encapsulation. Uh, of uh, your process you talk about uh, the idea of exploring what lies between notation and improvisation uh, and my question to you is what is it that lies between notation and improvisation and is that your process so uh, I love having this kind of artistic dialogue uh, between certain musicians, sometimes I provide material for them to decorate or improvise to a certain extent. Um, and sometimes uh, their so-called free improvisation or idiomatic improvisation mm -hmm. somehow infiltrates into my, into my world. Mm -hmm. um, but it, re it depends who I'm speaking to, obviously. And sometimes it's the kind of ideologies and aesthetics behind the thinking of this culture that's embodied in the taigum playing, for example, which is a Korean flute uh, made of bamboo. Um, or the kind of grainy sound or the uh, kind of structure of this particular process and the emotion behind this through Persian mm. daskar and you know, the, uh, often it comes in into the processes of thinking about intonation or tunings and think, uh, thinking about heterophony or thinking about, I, I, um, I, I kind of bring them in into, in, into that world. I mean, for- Through notation? Through notation, but not being so prescriptive. Yeah, I feel you're a bit, uh, on the fence about the the notation aspect of idiomatic uh, music or idiomatic gestures. We talked about this maybe before, uh, where you say uh, that, for example, taking uh, what we as maybe Arabs know more, the tradition of taqsim and what not, you feel that it, notation takes away maybe the soul of, or the essence of this play. So is it why you keep a margin of improvisation within your music? That's a big part of it, yeah. I've, I don't want to lose or suffocate them, or the people coming from those traditions. I want them to express themselves kind of based around the material I give them. But if they weren't from those traditions, say, or you wouldn't write the music in the first place, if they weren't from those traditions, um, well, I somehow I kind of leave an openness for them to fill in the what happens between the notes. Mm. So, I mean, it might not be that, say, I did have a melodic line. It might be that idiomatically or even beyond idiom, because some of them are rebels of their own traditions. Mm. Uh, they may not go from A to B in exactly the way I've asked. They might go from mm. A to B through different different lines and different processes in order to get to that point. So the A and B that you had given them 
would kind of be useless in a sense or is it not uh, useless to them is it ab in terms of trajectory or ab in terms of material trajectory and material depending so they they use it but they bypass the they can do i give them permission to Ah, do that okay see this is a a freeing way of uh, of of writing music it's a it's a you know you allow people to join you in the creative process uh, yeah, that is exactly no? yeah and uh if i may ask you've worked with people from many different traditions as you said but i'm interested to know what was your experience with arabic musicians and uh do you have a f- primary focus maybe on Arab music Arabic music more so than other traditions or you make no difference I used to have that focus and then uh, I felt other traditions or the people coming behind other traditions fulfilled my musical imagination and fantasy mm. more and gave me a little bit more freedom mm. in in the creative process mm. Um, not just through their processes and ideologies, but through sometimes through the sound sources. Um, but I can't restrict it to that because that is also just a very Western thing, isn't it? A Western concept when you just focus on the the sound, the mm. instrumental sound. I I'm beyond. I'm interested in beyond that. What are you interested in? The personalities behind the sound. The, the personalities yeah the personalities behind the sound um no two musicians from that same tradition will express things the same way Mm -hmm. and for me i think their individualities are what makes it if they're sometimes but it's like if they're willing to meet me halfway as well because it it's part of the you know the collaborative process when you're i mean it's like george apergis said mm-hmm. when we spoke pre podcast that half your music is written when you've chosen the right collaborators that's that's very true in practice that is you discover that in practice that uh, you can write the all the precise way you want to write and uh, it depends on the musician you're working with. We know for a fact that no two interpretations of the same written piece of music is going to be the same. Uh, we know that that's a, that's a, a certainty. But you know, with with collaboration, the problem lies in in two facets for me. The there's the problem of posterity. Uh, there's the problem of in the future mm. how will this music be played or you don't care about that at all uh, because suppose in a hundred years time we won't be here but our music might be and uh, it's curious to think that when you're not present to give instructions how does your music get played and there's the problem of the trace also, because you have to record this in order to have a trace of it, because there's this varying element every time. So do you, do you deal with those uh, subjects? Does it uh, bother you in any way or does it do, do you, yeah, tell me. Well, my system seems to work so far across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had different co- string quartets come and perform perform with uh, you know using my system and they haven't the they haven't had the need to contact me asking what it means Mm. so uh that helps a lot um but sometimes because within the system there's this ultimate freedom of free improvisation whatever that means is it really free improvisation or am i really it's me trying to sculpt it or me being the choreographer trying to create the you know choreograph the dance Mm. in a sense uh that's a very valid process of musical devising 
that ends up having an outcome that becomes sort of fixed, but there's always some fluidity in that. Yeah. So, um, if of course, yeah, you've asked very valid questions, you know. Uh, what about documenting, you know, how, I mean, there are pieces that are very prescriptive, um, like the one that is being performed tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in a We're sense... In Salgavo, by the in way. In the Salgavo, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> right in the heart of Paris. Yes. Um, but I did give them a, an instruction because it's pr very kind of precisely rhythmically written. I said, I want it to be more improvisatory. So they're like, oh, 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 oh what do you mean? Or yeah, like, you know, because you've written that, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, I just, because it, because, um, yeah, I wanted them to improvise the, you know, the, even the dynamics to insert more expression into those basic dynamics I gave mm -hmm. them. Uh, I had very precisely written those just to ev evoke improvisation, but that, you know, I wanted to see if they, either they could probably maybe move that, where that quaver inside a quintuplet goes, you know, just to, to really give it some element of freedom or make it sound free and spontaneous as opposed to what it's written. I mean, that's the thing, notation can be really imprisoning for some people it is it is it is imprisoning but see it's one of those uh, questions that don't really how do you how do you say that that can't really be asked because you wouldn't ask the question if you didn't have the material in the sense where we ask uh, what would have been like if I lived in the 1800s but you can't ask this question you, you can only ask this question because you exist today so it's like it's not really a question that has an answer and the thing with notation is that uh yes of course it's constricting it's not adequate to for a lot of musics maybe all of the musics outside of the musics that were written for this notation but it is it is cool i believe it is important to think about like the parameters that you set how do you control the outcome when you're not there and some people might say i don't care about controlling the outcome if i'm not there i don't care about controlling the outcome at all you seem to want to control the outcome but since when when you're present you add more uh freedom let's say be with your instructions mm. uh, and see this is this is something that is uh do you, do you believe it is it has anything to do with your upbringing in a way mm. with your you being Lebanese uh, with you having those you know improvisatory traditions in your ear in a way uh, or not at all um I won't deny that it's not a part of my musical diet since I was born or before that it's uh, probably formed a strong part of that need um, but in the sense that would be would it be returning home you know because I mean f as a the daughter of a diasporic parents who fled this Lebanese civil war um, that's also been a kind of question because mm -hmm. am i i'm trying to find home in my music but it's not necessarily through the arabic roots or the arabic way but there's a lot of overlap there's a lot of overlap through the silk road between all the kind of there's so many overlaps between the, some parts of china on that road in korea sometimes there's when i put a korean and a syrian nay player improvising together on the same melodic nuclear melody so to speak gosh it fits so well That's and a, at the same uh, time it's, the collision is beautiful mm. but there is no collision when there's something that's you know what is collision see you know i always like to mention 
Lebanon to my to my guests, even though this podcast is not aimed for Lebanese people only. Mm. Well, I've had majoritarily Lebanese people on the podcast. Yeah, is that what came out on your uh, yeah, your yeah. Uh, spiel, analytics? <laughs> in my analytics? No, no, in my, no. I'm talking about my my inter- my guests. No, your guests. Oh, okay, guess. okay. Sorry, I, I thought I had one Syrian guest. Uh, no, my viewers span uh, oh, yeah, the great. globe. In the globe. Uh, but do you feel that your process and your outcome, your output? is well received in your home country of let's say lebanon for the time being even okay. though it might be london uh, uh, do you ever struggle with that or do you feel that you're more accepted than you might have initially thought that you would be um i am um, i don't know if i'm in a position to have the overview of answering that mm. in terms of uh, being accepted. I mean, from the I had two performances by the Lebanese Philharmonic Orchestra, and one of the pieces had a little bit of material from some Lebanese folk tune. Mm. And at the end of it, I had this the actual folk tune it was inspired by come out as um, I was like holding it with the pianist who was the soloist in the piano concerto um, and she came out with me with the folk tune and being blasted out from the little uh, should be all had the portable CD player mm. it was a portable CD player <laughs> <laughs> very very uh, analog there yeah uh, I don't know they I, I felt they complete there was a hook for them there you know to really feel the there's some kind of connection. Mm. From the unknown with the known, with the, there's some anchor for them. And then I had a very, very, my first, I think, big premiere was for wind, brass, and percussion that had the most, I mean, the title was Le Fantôme de Rebecca Griffiths, and it had a whole kind of, uh, yeah, it says it, it says it, yeah. even just the title just gives them something to imagine. Yeah. They, uh, they, they were not, you know. That there, was in Lebanon. That was in Lebanon, yeah. Can you ma- and can you imagine? Hardly, yeah, but I can now. And uh, I think they were quite quite receptive. They were a bit more receptive to the the concerto, but um, they didn't poo poo it. <laughs> I would say because I know there would be quite an honest audience. They're they're a warm audience, obviously, but but with the general reception of my music, I have no idea. Like how things are. Are you called upon? Sometimes. In Lebanon. Sometimes. It's quite... Uh, it Really, the situation there doesn't invite me. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a commodity. Because you think. yourself are an educator. Yes. Uh, has it ever crossed your mind to, I don't know, Teach in Lebanon? Or? Oh yes, yeah. I'm. Uh, I yeah. I have proposed it, but it all needs funding. We're mm. very expensive. <laughs> 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 no, I'm not saying I'm, we're very kind of regular rates for Europe, but yeah. you know it's difficult. Yeah, in, in Lebanon, you know, they like to make you hear that you're expensive, even though they might pay for something even like absolutely outrageous that has no particular use. But yeah, uh, yeah there's no, always like I, the money issue in Lebanon. Yeah, no, I I'm know sorry, what you mean. Know, like, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it all depends. Well, even, even if you have big names with you, you know, it depends. Um, but yeah, is there something we should do about that? <laughs> Listen, I feel there's a craving, like you mentioned, the craving and the hunger for new music. I feel there's a craving for real education in music integration yes for education oh education 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 i feel that the young generation in lebanon feels that they have been betrayed by their educational system Mm. some of them might uh, at least in what sense whereby they they were they were withheld information 
willingly or unwillingly or knowingly or unknowingly. Mm. I tend to think that it was unknowingly withheld information uh, by the people providing that education. And they were given such a, you know, prestigious, glamorous, mystical vision of what music making is, of what music is, what composers throughout history were, you know, gods among men. And uh, now that they've seen a bit or felt that actually music can be demystified, mm. can be revealed, there is a craving for more. There is a mm. craving to see what can be done. And I believe there is a place for people like you to help provide this demystification that still today we can do music. Still today we can compose. Still today there is a need. You're talking about necessity in educational systems in England or lack thereof of necessity. I will finish this interview with, with a question. Do you feel that music is necessary today? I come from the position that it is. It music provides a lot of things and mostly good things. And sometimes it expresses things. Of course, it helps if there's something more more concrete to express mm. with a lyric or something. But at least the feeling it expresses things that people don't have the words for or the vocabulary inside themselves to to have. It's, it opens your eyes and ears to, to the, the mundane or taking mm. you away from the mundane or the mundanities. I mean, life has, is, uh, probably has been always, but it, it's increasingly stressful, I guess. Governments are ignoring the wishes of their peoples and uh, when that happens, there is much more rebelliousness and revolt. And so many people tell me who are not musicians that music gives them that space to just be. Uh, and why not? Why not indeed? Bushra Turk, I, I thank you for, for today. It's been a joy discussing whatever broadly or precisely we discussed. And I hope uh, you had a good time on this uh, episode. It was my pleasure, Nadim. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic.